our main goal is to help connect entrepreneurs with resources and capital. So venture philanthropy is a way of taking traditional venture and pairing it with philanthropy for the purpose of a social impact. So in this case, rare disease uh, doesn't get a lot of attention from pharmaceutical companies or bigger uh, investment funds that are looking for bigger returns or quicker turnaround. Um, so we would put that in the category of a social impact investment. Venture in general is definitely important to uh, help ensure that the early stage companies have that toehold of the commercialization journey. But I think where venture philanthropy, especially on behalf of an organization like American Cancer Society, has a, a unique opportunity is where you have an organization that's committed to understanding what the unmet need is for cancer patients. And to have to be positioned to be able to put dollars behind that, to direct commercial investment, that's a very compelling uh, position to be in and one that I think traditional venture capital firms would not necessarily be as well positioned for. All biotech scientific founders have a very hard road. And then you look at researchers and, and startup companies that are in the rare disease space, it's that much harder. Scientific entrepreneurs that are working on rare disease treatments deserve as much help as they can get. I think one of the unique opportunities that we have as ACS, and I think this is true for most venture philanthropy, is that when we deploy dollars, it's not necessarily just to return financial gains. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later on about how we assess impact. We talk impact all the time, and we measure it, and we try to be very diligent on how we measure it, but that is a large part of the reason why we can say, if we're investing in a company that's doing something that uh, maybe uh, have, affects less of a cancer population, but it's a type of cancer that is um, has had less development over um, recent years, or it's a longer path to clinical trial success. That makes a great case for the impact, because if we don't deploy those dollars, who will? Disruption is looking at the status quo, what has been done up to that point, and completely ripping the band-aid off and trying something and approaching it from a completely new standpoint. When you're thinking about rare disease patients and, and what a small number of patients uh, groups might be affected by a particular genetic disorder, um, the traditional models don't necessarily work. And the root, the root of this is patients and their families and parents who are looking to have a better life for their children. So I think it really, it takes a disruptive model to say, hey, how can we approach this in a completely different way um, to move the needle? We have been fortunate in the bleeding disorders community to see some profoundly important gene therapies come forward that are changing the lives of these individuals and their families. But these um, therapies are not accessible to everyone and there's room for improvement. So we really are looking for next generation disruptive technology. We're looking at platforms that may or may not be used now for bleeding disorders, but could be. And we're open to looking at diagnostics and medical devices because you can't treat a rare disease unless you know that you have it. So diagnosis is important and it's a big gap. It's a big unmet need in that a lot of people with bleeding disorders, especially women, go for years without a diagnosis with the wrong diagnosis. At this point in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we look at uh, the impact in innovation very heavily. Because we've come so far with many therapies that are either approved or in development right now, late stage clinical development, our focus right now are on disruptive technologies that will actually cure this disease. Regulators, policymakers need to understand that uh, by not doing something, all of our patients are gonna die. And so uh, there is a certain risk reward that has to be brought into the equation. Finding those point of nexus where innovation is happening between disciplines is really, is really important and it doesn't, it doesn't just come naturally up. So waiting for somebody to approach you with this type of activity doesn't work for us. Typically we have to go in very early and incentivize the movement of these activities. 
there are two parts to management structure. One is the executive side and one is mm -hmm. the, the governance of the board. And, and both are very important. Um, we do find that if you are able to make a story that is compelling to a, a very talented, experienced business executive, mm -hmm. often money follows. Mm -hmm. So money doesn't typically follow science as much as it follows people. When we're looking um, at a potential investment, mm -hmm. obviously the science is very, very important to us. Equally as important is the scientific and, and leadership team. Uh, our chief scientific officer often says that sometimes you can have science that doesn't look great, but you can fix it. But if you have a bad management team, you can't fix that. And so the team is extremely important. So selling a seasoned business executive is very important. So the deck that people first use when they're when they're trying to move is typically more sciency and um, you know doesn't necessarily resonate with time uh, metrics that matter. You know speed to market those kind of things. So changing the deck is really important. And when you get involved you, with a business executive, they often have people that they enjoy working with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one domino knocks a whole lot of other dominoes down. And so finding that first CEO, saving enough equity on the option pool for this individual who is probably going to be pretty expensive, um, being patient and not giving away the title of CEO too early to somebody who you know is not going to be the one that's gonna take this public or take this to the next level. Um, so just being really open with the community and saying, we need some interim, part-time people to get us to the stage where we can hire this, this person who has a group of people around them that can really move this technology. We welcome competition in all areas mm -hmm. of drug development. Um, and we, we um, are looking forward to um, success. Now, our, if there's competitive um, therapies, we don't really worry about that. We actually champion both because you never really know who's going to come out with a better science. Actually, whether we're investing or not, if somebody's got a solution that meets an unmet need in our community, we want them to be successful. So as a small fund, we're seeing a lot of things that we would invest in if we had additional resources. And so one of the things that we've said is, what do we have that we can put to work to help those companies be successful as well, even if we're not investing? We have access to KOLs, we have access to the experienced experts. Um, we can introduce them to other investors, whether we're investing or not. So, you know, what's important to us is that there are solutions and we'd love to be part of those solutions mm -hmm. one way or the other. We'd love to be as investors because that helps us you know, deliver on our evergreen fund model. But at the end of the day, it's, what's important is that the therapies and cures are there. Sure. Science uh, is often very malleable. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's mostly tethered to the people who are trying to execute the science. So having individuals on the team who are open to change is really important, but also people that are stubborn and willing to just run it down to the ground. Even if a competitor shows up who has more money, it doesn't mean that they're going to make it. So, you know, in, in some ways you want to be overly stubborn and not have people fleetingly pivot mm -hmm. to another area where there isn't a competitor. That is defined as you have a series of grants that you've been doing research with, and then there's somewhat of an awkward point where you're not doing research anymore, you should be doing development. And in, in drug development, that is a series of experiments, and you can kind of feel the tension in academia or in a small company of when you're supposed to be moving on to development. Uh, and that point of tension is the valley of death because grants aren't a great fit and venture typically wants something de-risked enough, uh, often they say clinical data, in order to move forward with an investment. And so this, this valley is acute in all of biotech across all the different industries, but in biotech, it's a series of experiments and it's usually the pre-IND pre experiments. The people that typically get forgotten um, in this collaborative environment uh, are the, the doers, that's how I call them. You know, you have regulatory consultants, you have the consultants that really know how to get things done. You have um, medicinal chemists, and often we treat them as people that you can just hire one. And it's just not true. You, you wanna work with people 
who are really in the space that you want to be in, who have a specific uh, use case in whatever mouse model you need. You need someone with the exact right expertise. And so those people aren't interchangeable. So bringing this collaborative environment of the right people at the right time is, is so important to move out of the valley. This is the ecosystem of rare disease and therapy development. Many of you are represented in this room. And I think, you know, what's important is that today's discussions have really shown that no, no single institution, whether a patient advocacy group, a biotech, uh, uh, researchers, venture capitalists, we can't do it alone, right? We're seeing that there's more collaboration happening and we're just a very small part of this and we're happy to play um, even a small role to connect people and researchers um, to collaborate and learn from each other. And I think that really there's a lot of momentum happening and a lot of promise in rare disease.